Welcome back to Parry Talks. <laughs> Done. That makes it so much easier. Sometimes it's so hard to bite the bullet, I think, on a conversation because it's like, in real life, it's never like the conversation starts. Yeah. Now. But Parry Talks, or you might be watching this on Purple Sneakers or either, you know, direct from the Man, the Myth, the Legends platform here. But very grateful um, to be welcoming this very special guest. There's been so much going on in my world, so much more going on in his world. So to sort of, you know, pick the momentum back for both of us, I think, in this format, you know, super grateful to be in a space like this. You know, if you're, if you're familiar with any of my work, we're never too grateful. You know, we're, we're never, very rarely have the opportunity to sort of sit in a room like this and have a real deep, chill conversation. But so many more to come. But man, it's album mode, it's Colour Undone. Mm-hmm. As we're speaking right now, there's three singles down. The album release is imminent. Yep. This is a big question and a tough one to start it off, but what's the feeling like right now? Is it like, you know, is there an anxiety to it or is it almost all energy or is it just, let's make it happen? I think it's like, right now I'm trying to find a balance of remaining patient because it's like, it's right there. Um, and also not expecting anything mm. and just enjoying the journey of putting out my debut album, which is a tough thing to try and do amongst it all. But that's, I'd, I'd say that's where I'm at right now. Is that the first time you've almost said it like, had a chance to like say it out loud? Is it yeah, surreal saying like, that? Oh, is it shit. surreal saying that? Yeah, yeah. When I said that, like, because I've just been so wrapped in the single rollouts, you know what I mean? Of course, it's leading to the album. But for a moment there, I was getting so caught in the, the now of it. Yeah. Like, okay, what's this doing right now? Next single, what's this doing right now? Moving, moving. Um, and at this current time, it's just me getting back to the bigger picture mm. view of it. Because I think it's so easy to get lost in it when you're just in it. Definitely. I think, I think a big thing about that in this sort of world right now and I ask you this question, is it like, there's a lot of like, either like cookie cutter music or a lot of like present focused music, mm. but you're making something that's timeless almost, which makes the getting the validation and the reward for it interesting mm. because it's not about the first week or the first reaction. You want it to, you know, sort of sit with people. So where do you think in the long run you'll get the gratification from in the color and done? Damn, I think like, uh, I, I, I hope to get it from myself mm. um and just knowing that the project is done has been done for a minute we're putting it out and once it's out it's like okay cool debut album's done for me the way i work is like on to the next how do we keep moving um it's a mix of that what it does for my life and my journey regardless of what accolades and such like yeah. of course all that stuff is definitely the aim and i'll have some days where i'm like we're going to get this yeah, let's do it. 100%. Um, and just purely out of the sake of having those moments for people like my mother or my father because it's something that they can grab onto where it's like awards, um, ticket sales, this, that. So that's definitely validation in its own sense. But I think personally, it's just like, I think I've already validated myself in the album that I've made. And I listen to it, I'm like, okay, sweet. That feels like the best album I can make right now. Facts. I think I'm going to sidetrack already because we're in this. It's so interesting working in sort of like any sort of creative creative thing. Like whether you're interviewing someone, whether you are the artist, whether you take photos. And it's like speaking to either like family or friends that aren't in it. And it's like sometimes you want that validation so that you can show them being like, hey, like Mm. this is like you know what an R, not necessarily R is specifically, but you know what an R is. You know, like, who Pharrell is. And I interviewed someone that, like, worked with Pharrell. Mm. So it's so interesting, like, trying to, like, you know, not be so involved in the external stuff, even though that's what a lot of people around you sort of expect from you as, like, a gauge of success. Mm. But it also takes the price up, to be honest. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> I win an so Aria, true. my price goes up. So, like, of course, all of these things are what I'm aiming for. Um and I think the balance is not needing to find validation from it, but seeing its purpose mm. as it is. Definitely. Because you need longevity as an artist. And a big thing about longevity when you're making cool shit is to be, 
you know, comfortable and stable mm. as well. Mm -hmm. It's such a big part of that. Let's take it all the way back though. I've done some very <laughs> crazy, re no, not really. yeah. <laughs> a little bit of research. First album you ever bought. I know what it is. You don't have to say it. I, I, okay. Ice Cube, laugh now, cry later. Mm. Obviously, dad being an MC, it's a big influence influence in you know entering the hip hop world. But if you could even think outside of that, which is sort of an impossible thing to do, but what does an album like that or a genre like that at that age sort of mean to you? It was just fun. Like mm. I remember me and my brother, <laughs> we remade the Why We Thugs film clip in our backyard when we lived in Marrickville. I think I was like 12, uh, like between 10 and 12. Um, and we shot that shit on like some old phone, we chopped it up. I didn't even know how we chopped it up. But it was really just fun in that type of music and the energy in that type of music because like that's the stuff I grew up, grew up around. And I, I know it was that, it's either that or an MJ album that I brought first. But mm -hmm. I do remember going to Ice Cube's Laugh Now Cry Later show at MO Theatre well. with dad and my brother. Um, and I was standing there, it's super still and awkward and just like in shock. Like it's Ice Cube, it's Afro era Ice Cube. Um, you know, crip walking on stage, doing the most, and it's just like, this is hectic. Um, and so I think if I can tie it back to how I feel, it's just like fun and intrigued by it. Yeah. How, how old were you when you, when, you, when you went to an Ice Cube show? I would have been like anywhere between 10 and 12. And they let you in? Yeah. Like, I, I think it was all ages. I'm pretty sure it was all ages show. But... Um, Dad was very close friends with Maya Jupiter, who used to work at Triple J. Um, and she, you know, lined up Dad with the tickets and we rolled through and watched Ice Cube do his thing. Definitely. And I think, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking too much about this, but I grew up in like a Greek household, mm -hmm. you know, parents' second language being English, grandparents don't even speak English. And you sort of, like, I think about my formative years with the genre of hip hop where it's like, not that I have any sort of relation to it at all, but it's like there was something, it was outside of Australia's sort of mm. cultural narrative and that really dragged me into it where it's like, you know, because Australian culture is so cooked in my opinion. The idea of Australian culture is disgusting. Um, so coming into it, it was just like, oh, here's this crazy new thing where people are speaking about different things and talking to stuff that, you know, I've thought about or you know, mental health stuff that I've thought about that was sort of outside of the Australian narrative of culture. Do you mm. think that dragged you in as well? Yeah, and also just purely out of like being six, seven, eight years old, driving up the mission to get firewood in my uncles and they're playing Easy e mm. And it's just like artists that they could relate to in their early 20s um, was the artist that I was listening to just by default. So I think purely out of being able to relate in a sense to the struggle and the feeling that they would go through as people of color and like putting that back to, okay, this works with what we go through on the mission. You know what I mean? Um, in some way, shape or form, there was always something we could take from it and be like, I feel like these artists are not necessarily speaking for or to us, but yeah. there's something in it that we can grab onto and feel like, okay, there's nothing in, Australian hip hop music right now in the time of early 2000s that we could necessarily feel a part of. So it was just like NWA, Easy E, uh, Tupac, Biggie, like that was all stuff that's playing at the mission parties. That and like Fleetwood Mac, Randy Travis, Alan Jackson. So yeah. it's like two completely different worlds, but that is definitely the, the party vibes. It's so true. Of the, um, bro, two back at a hold on Western Sydney in that era. I feel like every like Greek, Middle Eastern, Polynesian community, two back just had like a hold on it for some reason. It was yeah. just like such like the cultural icons from that era. I feel like, and there's a whole generation of people now, like young people that grew up on that stuff, and it's mm. like it's crazy to think that we grew up on like the most crazy <laughs> hectic yeah. music that was so foreign to me anyway. And it's mm. like, just such a powerful genre by default, I think. It's so, so like, 
Oh. Well, bro, that's the thing is like, there's even, you know, some uncles that are buried up home and there's a Tupac album on their, on their grave. Yeah. Like, that's how much it's embedded into like Barrel Mission and my community. And I know it is in plenty of other communities as well. Definitely. Respect. Um, the world has changed. This is a difficult question. I, I apologize in advance for it. But, oh man, obviously an MC. A yeah. massive shout out to him. And the world has obviously changed so much since your romance started rapping with just the climate of, you know, what Australian hip-hop is. And I think the scope of how far an Australian artist can go. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, now it seems sort of realistic that an artist like you can really break overseas if you try hard enough or make the right music. Mm -hmm. Is there sort of something in the back of your mind where it's like you want to fulfill almost his legacy as well? I think it's not something I necessarily feel, mm. but I definitely know it's probably one of the factors that drive me to do what I do because I've always said I feel like when you know my father was doing it that there was a ceiling for what yeah. he could do here um and just the support he's continued to show me and just being like you know he's he's understanding that he had his time at it um and now he gets joy and fulfillment in seeing me take it to new heights so i think definitely by default it's it's something that's there yeah, yeah that's it's gorgeous i think and also like making an old man, man proud your old man plan any old man proud it's like it's it's just so deep down embedded i think in in everything where it's like you see like so many dads live through their sons in such toxic ways obviously mm. but seeing that in a wholesome way evolve through you and i like i thought about it maybe on a more subconscious level but like thinking about that i was like oh that makes me really happy that like something like that and the times have changed and now we can move on and move forward and move bigger throughout it i think 100 percent. i want to talk about this because when you were eight moved from barville to sydney mm. just what was that move like you know big city it would have been probably super confronting right i remember we moved to uh moved to i think it was granville um I'm, I was eight, so I can't yeah, remember. Yeah. But I just remember uh, mum and dad were split at the time. Um, but we moved to Sydney because dad was doing his thing down here. And as, you know, as mum and dad have always done, they've always put us first. And so when we moved down, it was purely to be closer to dad. Um, I just remember mum being super broke, like dad being super broke as well. To the point where mum would have to work like two jobs, three jobs. She, I remember waking up, she'd get us ready for school. We'd get to school at like 8.39. She'd go straight to work. She'd finish work at six. She'd come back from six to eight, nine, put us to bed. And then she'd go to a night shift job and finish at 6 a.m. and come back and do that like five days a week just to be able to put food on the table. Mm. So I think like what it was like for me because we were in it. And I think whenever you are in as as a child i think whenever you're in poverty you don't see it like that because like you're you're finding ways to still have fun i remember us doing like we we're in like this um i don't know the exact word for it but it's like kind of like this halfway house thing we were waiting to get into different uh housing commission houses and we got put in this spot on top of some dodgy like uh corner store in the middle of the city and i remember so well because the first time i saw mary poppins <laughs> so she always sticks to me um and like i remember going to the window and opening the window and it was just like a brick wall and just like a bunch of toilet paper piled up and that's when i was like oh yeah we're broke <laughs> i yeah. mean like that's when it hit but at the same night i saw mary poppins for the first time and from then i started singing like uh, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down that type of shit my brother and we just always found ways to have fun and and mum would always find ways to make sure we were growing and thriving as children so like as much as the move was very i guess like it, it was such a different life to barrowville it was just always uh a supportive environment for us regardless because of our parents definitely um were you rapping at that time yeah. or like yeah yeah 
I said you... it like it's obvious, like I'm eight years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was rapping. <laughs> um, okay, we get it, whatever. Um, when did you start? When was it like, oh, I'm going to be a rapper? Um, there was, there was, was like in that few... period? No, nah, so at, at eight, it was just like me, my brother and my cousin, and we're called the Dot Eye Boys because that was one of the streets on the mission. Uh, there was three of us and we'd just take a turn each writing verses like dad would help us with the verses we'd write some of our own and just like really find just the enjoyment in making music and hearing it back and being like shocked at like us being able to do that so then is when I knew that like I fell in love with it at 14 years old when I moved back to Barrow from Sydney mm. um, I actually met a guy who I'm not so close with at the moment or right now in general, which is unfortunate, but his name's Zach. And like, without this dude, I would probably not be where I am because he was somebody that every day would be like, let's go to the studio, which was a small room in a youth center type thing, uh, carpet on the walls, stunk. But there's always just like six of us in there writing raps. And I think at 14 was when I was like, okay, I want to work on my craft at being a rapper. Um, I was also playing rugby league at the same time and then I got to 18 because uh, I was making representative sides and, and such like halfback um, and really loved the sport yeah. and so I had to make the choice I was like okay I can't put 50% into one thing and 50 into another what's it going to be and I was like music yeah. and so like I think those three stages is definitely has definitely all played their part so I can't necessarily narrow it down to one yeah. but it's somewhere amongst all that Rugby league. Yeah. Has anyone ever said you look like Adam Reynolds? Nah. Do I? I can you have Adam Reynolds nah, vibes. Nah. Which is like the biggest compliment. <laughs> I, reckon, I got, I got I Mark like... Wahlberg the other day. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much of a compliment. Nah. So you're playing, of course you're playing halfback as well. It just makes so much sense. I was playing winger, but then like I went back to Barrel and I didn't like winger because that's where they put kids that cannot play. Um, and I was like, they were like, what position do you play? And I just said, oh, halfback. Kicking game elite. <laughs> yeah, and they, they, they put me in there. There are a lot of similarities between being a halfback and rapping. You think so? You've got to be in control. You're running that. You're running the ball. Yeah, there. true. There's so many moving true. parts. No, there aren't really any. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a few. What was the music like? I'm super intrigued. At like in, in between, I'm going to do music, sorry, footy, mm. and going to that small studio. What was the energy or the vibe of the music? Just talking shit. Nice. Just like, just really, because I was rapping with cousins that, so I was like 14, rapping with cousins that were 18, 19, 20, and I always felt like I need to rap about what they're rapping about mm. because like, that's cool. And even though I never experienced these things, I would just act like I did. Um, and so it was, it was a lot of just like, let me try and impress my older cousins and try and be the best, best, like the best rapper in this room that I can be and competing with my yeah. cousins. Do you think that like, obviously cause you're early, there's no career yet necessarily. Do you think that just practicing writing, even without the life experience, just being like, Oh, I don't know anything. Like I haven't lived this, but I'm going to try write a rhyme about it. Sort of helped you just like fast track mm. the process of like getting good at just rapping straight. 100% because like, even though I didn't necessarily experience some of these things, I was in a community where I saw, because when I moved back to Barrow at 14, that's when I was really like, I started to really see where I'm from and figure stuff out and meet family members I didn't know. Um, and I think I was just very open to other people's experiences. So by default, I was able to just channel what I see, you know, certain people going through. Definitely. Yeah, and I think, and it's also such an age thing as well, right? The rap is all about life experience and saying and hearing like Nas write Illmatic at that age, and it's like, how does someone have the self awareness to do that? Mm. And it's it's just ridiculous how some people are so good at it so young, but there's a blessing as well when it comes from an older mind and older heart. Like if you look at Jay Z four forty four, or even like the stuff Freddie Gibbs is doing now, like. Or Danny Brown, like mm. they're older men, and you can feel it in like the way they tell a story, or you know their life experience is just so mature and so incredible that, like, it's just there's a level of 
critical thinking and age and wisdom about it. I think that's the beauty of like rap music generally and the way that it grows with people and changes with people. Cause it's not just a song where it's like, mm. oh, I fell in love with this girl and now, uh. yeah. But we can do that too, you know. But it's, it, I, I feel like right now as well as we're starting to see, uh, like the the longevity artists in rap music, mm. which is great to to be able to witness for probably the first time in the history of the music. Um, like you said, Jay Z, who is somebody like like I didn't necessarily listen to until I got to a certain age, and then when I got to that age, I was like, Yeah, yep, yeah, great, one hundred percent. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I, can... I, I wasn't a Jay Z listener at, at at a young age. You know what I mean? And then like I got to maybe 21, maybe 20, and I was like, I just I enjoyed it a yeah. bit more. Izzo had a stronghold on me forever. Mm. Since I can remember hearing that song for the first time, just the Oh, there's definitely some joints, <laughs> but I was never like, you know, a be all end all Jay-Z yeah. fan. Nah, we can <laughs> I wanna argue with you about why, <laughs> why not about why you should Because Nah, I'm joking. Because <laughs> on the mission, growing up. It was just like, I think we we're just so West Coast driven. Yeah, I like, feel Like, you hear it in Mission Famous and things yeah. of my earlier discography, it's like, that's West Coast. Because, like, that's what was always getting up to the community. Definitely. And perfect segue into Mission Famous. And, like, obviously we're fast-tracking a lot. But I want to get to that where, you know, how do you reflect on music like that now with what you're making now? Is it, is there still, there's obviously a lot of pride in the sentiment of those songs. But, you know, do you see it as just like a necessary step, um, just an era, or is it, you know, how do you just reflect on a project like that, looking back on it now with older eyes? With that project, it was like, it's always going to have a special place in my heart, regardless of what it has done or will continue to do, purely because what, what happened around that project was like, we lost an uncle. It was like a day after the the show in Barrowville for the Mission Famous EP tour. Mm. Um, and we were all able to have that one last night with him. And he was able to come watch the show. And the next day we're driving up the Miz to shoot the Mission Famous video. I get pulled up by a cousin. And he's like, oh, your Uncle Joby just passed. And like, this, like, bear in mind, this is the uncle that gave me my name, Tasman. This is the uncle that like, really, I like, loved, you know what I mean? And I would see him, we would see him every day or every second day, he would just stop in a home. Um, and my brother was on set. And I said to my cousin, because I was driving with him, I was like, do I tell Sam? Do I hold it till we get like the video done? I told him before we shot the video. He broke down. I was like, bro, let's like, let's do what we need to do for him. And then we'll go home and we'll deal with it. A week later, I'm still on tour. Um, I think we're at Newcastle. The funeral's the next day, so we drive up to Barrowville after the Newcastle show. I get to the viewing, so we go to the viewing, um, and my uncle's like, do you have the Mission Famous EP with you? And I'm like, yep, I've got the box of them because we're on tour. And he's like, could you leave it at his feet in the coffin because all the nephews are leaving something at his feet. That means yeah. a lot to them and to him. Um, so I was like, left it at his feet, said goodbye to him. Uh, 20 minutes later, the same uncle came up to me. He's like, do you mind if we use the song My Pelopolis to put him in the ground to? And can you be one of the pallbearers? And I was like, of course. And so, like, funeral comes. I'm walking down, listen to Pelopolis playing, which is a song about, you know, the amount of death I see, but our spirit living forever. Having to hold the uncle that named me and, you know, lay him to rest. So the way that I reflect on that project is honestly when I go back up home and I go visit him or I still see people on the mission pumping that EP. Yeah. It's not necessarily a thing of like me reflecting critically on it. Of course, there's some times where I do that, but I think what that project did for the family doesn't allow me to be yeah. selfish and try and find a reason to pick at it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's honestly just in moments I go home and see what it's done and what it has, the, the foundation it set. Because I feel like the foundation I set with Mission Famous was like, this is who I am, this is where I'm from. No, mat no, no matter where I take it now, 
you can always go back. Yeah, to it's that. always there. Yeah, my condolences as well. Oh, no, thank you, bro. It's also super beautiful. Like mm. oh, that's rocked me a little bit. But um, also, if you haven't already, there is sort of like this vice short mm. documentary thing. Highly recommend watching it. It's super beautiful. It's super nice and so well put together as well. So yeah. if you haven't watched that, um, please watch that because it really sums up the whole EP really well as well. Um, sort of moving on from that, um, obviously dominating your hometown is super important. I think it's super important to do that for any artist before they start moving on and thinking big. Mm. Was there a moment internally for you where it's like, I'm super proud of that work. It's epic. All my family's pumping it. All the neighbors are pumping it. Um, when did the mindset switch to, okay, let's see what we can do with this now as an artist? Always. Like I, I always did it um, to, like my mindset with it is like, if I'm not doing it for the highest of heights, then like, why am I wasting my time or energy on it? Um, and being, you know, or growing up where I grew up, as I said, like the music that always connected was that internationally. So it was like, that was always in sight. But I think what Mission Famous did and what I needed to do first was just cement myself and introduce mm. myself. And because it's, it's crazy, there's people that like at the shows are singing Mission Famous and have never been on a mission in their life. But that's beautiful, you know what I mean? Because it's like these stories that I, especially in that project that I feel is so close to home and me, obviously connect. Yeah. And so like, it was always in sight. I just think that was a necessary step I needed to take first. Yeah, definitely. This is a very weird sidetrack, but I just brought up Freddie Gibbs. Mm. Did you support Freddie Gibbs yeah, at that yeah, time? Yeah. I remember that was the first time I think I ever saw you or heard of your music and stuff. Just sitting there, I'm like, mm. sick. Um, which sort of relates to sort of the next question as well. Um, not really, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about one. One, yep. As a sort of like bridge towards to getting to the okay. album because it feels like I've been speaking for ages. I haven't even touched the surface. Um, sort of felt like a new era, the beginning of a new era. Um, when did you meet Kwame and how did that relationship start? Um, I met him, I met him in 2019, briefly after the, the bushfires and there was a fundraiser at MO Theatre. Um, we had like small interaction online here and there. Uh, met him briefly at that and then I think I was working on To Make Concern and I had These Devils but I just know it needed something else in production and I asked uh, Zero who was engineering it I was like who do you think I should bring in for just some just to put some stuff onto it and he's like do you want me to ask Kwame I was like yeah hit him up he rolled through the next day uh, we started just talking and I was like damn bro you think exactly like me and he was the same thing like we started talking about stuff and I was like, I didn't know that there was somebody else in this scene out there that feels the same way I do about certain yeah. things. And it was just like, it was nice to, to have that conversation. Uh, from there, I think three weeks later, I was speaking to, to Zero about doing a writing trip for whatever project was to come up to make concern. Uh, and he was saying that, you know, Kwame was thinking about doing the same thing. Uh, I think I get a text from Kwame like two weeks later, being like, hey, we're gonna do a writing trip come two weeks um in that was in january 2021 the first writing trip uh which was a risk because like <laughs> yeah anything can happen yeah <laughs> and i'm staying with we're all staying together for two weeks straight i'm sharing a room with phil fresh i've only ever spent six hours with, with phil fresh like now we're sharing the same room you know what i mean so like it was it was a risk but like from the jump that was so easy that was like family from the jump yeah. um and from that writing trip came one and it's funny with one because i it was my joint second verse was empty uh when we go back to sydney kwame was working on the production for it he sent it back he was like oh by the way <laughs> He's a verse. I, I added a verse <laughs> and i was like damn that's hard i gotta do a third verse now because yeah. like i can't let you just take the second verse and run uh did the third verse and yeah, that's that. But like, he's somebody that I have um, endless amount of respect and love for and somebody that I consider a brother in this. And like, we just got off the phone the other night, like three hour phone call. 
we're talking about stuff and it's it's bigger than just music mm. with him and I. And I'm super thankful that, uh, you know, we were allowed the opportunities to be in the same space to to continue to grow the friendship that we now have. Do you see it as a new era, that writing trip, as beginning yeah. something? Yep, 100%. It was like, because a lot of the time I was working and writing to myself in rooms or whatever, um, or it'd be a very small amount of people in there, like I'm talking like two people. Uh, with that, it was a lot of people that I've never written music with before. And the not even the pressure, but just the the energy mm. in in that writing trip was definitely a new era of like, okay, cool. Let me let me work like this. Yeah. Do you want to just shout out whoever was there before we go further into it? Yeah, there, so was, I don't forget there was Kwame, uh, my brother, Capital J, Bill Fresh, Kimmy, uh, Zero, Nikos, Bill. I think that's it. <laughs> why, do you, yeah. why do you think you all work so well together? Because they're scattered across the project as well. Mm. Production, obviously, all over the project. And just sort of as this crew, because I think people sort of, even though musically... It's everyone makes such different music. Mm. Um, people love grouping shit in with other people, and I think naturally that's where you'd fit in as well. But why do you think, as creatives, you all sort of work together, or as individuals even? I think we just get along as people, um, as jokes all the time. Like we, you know, what I mean, it's just it's just the simplicity of there's there's also a respect for each other that um, I feel is evident when we're in the same room or when we speak about each other in public. Um, I don't know if I necessarily know the exact answer, yeah. but there is definitely <laughs> something that whenever we get in the room, whether or not the song comes out, it's always like, it just clicks. Definitely. Does Phil Fresh keep his room clean? I reckon he's He dirty. does. Nah, he does. He gives me dirty room vibes. He was a, he was a great roommate for that two <laughs> weeks. Okay, I'll give it to him. Because I feel like he gives me similar vibes to me. <laughs> yeah, like deep so? down, I feel like we're sort of like sort of goofy, like people. He cooks a mean burrito. Really? Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. Um, <laughs> let's. I'm just gonna lean back with this glass of wine. The singles. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're here. I think we're ready to start talking about. Yep. The big elephant in the room. Yep. I feel like you're going for the jugular with the singles. Um, the juxtaposition of them is super interesting to me, mm. and how different they all are. Um, and sonically so unique in their own ways. Just open up the, I'm just opening the floor. Talk to the decision of, you know, leading with the sort of freestyle vibe and then hitting with love too soon. Was it, was it almost deliberate? Like, let's throw people off guard. Yeah. 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 100%. It was also just like me wanting to give five foot freestyle its moment, because I think if I didn't put that out first, it wouldn't have its moment. Um, I wanted to come out the gate saying some shit yep. and dropping some names and just really getting back into like the sport of rap and it's not even from a thing of like I dislike these dudes it's like nah I respect these dudes but like yeah. let me just test the waters yeah um, and I wanted to do that first purely out of like knowing what I had in the back pocket yeah. knowing that Love Too Soon would come next um, and there there was obviously discussions of like should we hold love too soon and build to that? And my, the way I stood with it was like, nah, shock value. Like, cool, let me come out rapping, saying some shit, but then let me go dance on a pier and sing a song to a lady Definitely. six weeks later. Yeah. I'm five foot freestyle, the five feet freestyle. Five, five foot. foot. What? Anyway, <laughs> five feet. Where's my brain at? Um, do you think there's more room for a bit of, Sparring in Australia, yeah, one hundred percent, yeah. Because there's like, a lot of good rappers now. Yeah, definitely. Well, not that there wasn't before, but there are a lot of good mm. rappers, and I think I definitely think there's more room for a bit of. Yeah, I was I was hoping for it. Like I would not be shy and say that I wasn't <laughs> yeah. throwing bait to try and get somebody to grab onto it. Um, I feel like there's definitely room for it as long as it's not with like ill intent, no. um, with respect, and I think. I think there's always room for it in rap. It's like, as much as I'm at the point now where I'm like, uh, so well with inside of myself that I don't need validation from anybody else. Definitely. But it's also like the, the competitive person 
in me that stems from sport, rugby league, da, 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 listening to rap music growing up, wants that moment. And that's why I was like, let me just drop this and show people that like, there ain't even any lines that are aggressive. No, it's just like, it's fun. Yeah. Also, I think this is actually a more serious point on the one that I was sort of making earlier as a joke. Um, do you think that your love for sport or mm. rugby league was almost similar to your like love for rap in that competitive sense? Yep. Where it's like... 100%. Yeah. Because you were talking about how you wanted to be the best person in the room mm. when you're with your cousins and stuff. Do you think it was almost like that similar drive where you just like yep. a certain level of growth and achievement to it? Yeah, it's, it's like it's the same way that I went into writing the album and writing these joints where before we locked in, like an athlete, I would wake up and I'd have writing drills. So like I'd wake up at six, go to the gym, get back at 7.30, start writing drills at eight, which included things like uh, putting pen to paper and not taking your hand off of it for three pages. Doesn't matter if you write some bullshit. And I learned this like watching a J. Cole interview and I, was, I noticed it was something he done in Born Sinner. So I was like, let me, let me see how that works for me. Did that, it was like word associations, uh, rhyme schemes, and just stuff that as an athlete in the sport of rap, yeah. I wanted to do before we locked in. Definitely. Yeah, I'd, I'd never really thought about it like that, but it's so true. Like this idea of training. Mm. You gotta do it, it's a muscle, like, and I feel like the, the way I stand with it is I know it's, it's sometimes for people it's a thing of like, I'm waiting for inspiration to come. That's, that's fine. But I think while you're waiting for whatever it is you need to hit you to hit you, you can still be in the practice to be, you know, great at what you do. Definitely. How were you feeling the night before Love Too Soon came out? I was nervous. I was so nervous. I, were, I won't even lie to you. I was, <laughs> I was nervous. I was like, damn, what if, like, this is such a left turn for me. Not for me, but for others perspective of me yeah. for me that's music I've always wanted to make and I've, I've grown up listening to music like that um, but it came from the uncertainty of like I know that when I drop rap music it goes well because people love Tasman Keith that raps love too soon it was like really putting myself out there I remember showing uh, one of my cousins the video and the song and he was like when I watch that I feel like I'm watching he's like I don't feel like I'm watching Tasman Keith he's like I feel like I'm watching you like yeah. the you that we know. And so like for me, putting myself out there like that was super nerve wracking, but like wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, because of that feedback as well, reflecting on it, did you feel almost super comfortable writing it even though it was outside of your normal pocket? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was there all day. Like I, yeah, there, you... there was one moment where I was in the pre-chorus, it was the pre-chorus and I remember uh, sitting with Kwame, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to leave that pre-chorus and I might change it. And he's like, do not change that. And I was like, why? Why? And he's like, it's pop. He's like, leave it. Yeah. And it's a pre-chorus. Yeah. We, ha we, had the, we had the conversation of like, um, knowing what's needed in certain parts of music. And it was me in that moment being like, oh, but I'm so used to being intricate with words. And this pre-chorus is almost cheesy so much so that it's great pop music. Um, that was the only moment where I was like questioning some stuff. Mm. But other than that, recording that, I remember like, I remember I, to be honest, like I, I smoked a joint before I recorded the harmonies, locked into the booth. <laughs> Don't think about it yet, just make it happen. Yeah, and like went and looked at like, you know, some, some old inspiration texts from breakups. Yeah. <laughs> Tapped into a zone, the same way I do with any other music. And just sung that shit. Yeah. And made sure I was in the character of that song. Yeah. Rather than like rap sounds like Keith. Definitely. Well, I guess we're going to talk about healing a lot, I think, um, in the next little portion. But when like everyone knows the feeling of like literally song title loving too soon. Mm -hmm. This can either be generally or in that specific moment. Is that something that you want to write about in the heat of the moment? Or is that something that you want to sit with? Okay, this is how I feel about it. Mm. And then look back and be like, okay, now I can write from that perspective. With Love Too Soon, I think it was a balance. It was still like, it was still in the heat of the moment. And it was still something that, damn, I'm really speaking about this. It was still something that could have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was me really questioning it. Like, can it still happen in that time? Yeah. Um, so with that joint, 
it was definitely in the heat of the moment. Definitely. And then check. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. Um, just, <laughs> just cra- I don't even know what to say. It's just crazy. Like, um, I've never really heard an Australian rap song almost that braggadocious in a hot way, mm-hmm. especially with the Genesis of Wusu verse. Mm-hmm. What was it like hearing his verse for the first time? I remember we, we were, we were like tossing around who to, who to ask for the feature on that song. And a few names came up and then we got to Genesis and I, I made the call. I just rung him direct. I was like, bro, I have a song, um, that you should talk your shit on. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he was like, yeah, I, I've got, he's like, I've been waiting to talk my shit. I'm like, hectic. Send him through the joint. He's like, yep, can do this for sure. Came through the studio. Actually, it wasn't in the studio. It was like Zero's house. So it was in his room we are recording. Um, came through, laid the verse. And just the hearing him rap like that and being braggadocious, and which he still is in yeah. the way he does it. But hearing him uh, coming back to like rap was great. Um, and I feel like it was a great moment for him as well because he was like, yeah, I've got some shit to say. And in that verse, you can definitely tell. Yeah, he's hungry. Yeah, he has some shit to say. Do you ever get worried that you get washed on songs? No. Nah. Not, not in that scenario at all. Nah, I'm not saying nah, that. No, nah, nah. But like, is it ever an anxiety where it's like, um, will that be ever something you think about? No. Oh, maybe like, I don't, I don't think it's a thing of like, damn, I'm gonna get washed. I think it's just a thing of like, let me write a great verse because you wanna, yeah. the person in this room is writing a great verse as well. And if it ever gets to the point where like, I put my all into it and they get the better of it. They, they get the better of me through that joint. It's like, so fair yeah. play. Yeah, like, great verse, hard verse, 100%. Yeah. But I, I don't think I'd ever be the type of artist to send a joint, they send their verse back, and I and I'd put it out with a new verse without them hearing it. Like, yeah. I'm not going to do that shit. That's disrespect. Um, I guess a good way to sort of segue into the whole album sort of conversation is like, all the music videos so far have been incredible mm. and I want to talk to you about this idea of world building mm. you know the album itself is a world and you want to feel like a world and that stuff comes from everything outside of the record as well um, you know how do you begin to approach something like that is it like after the music's finished is it during the music comes in or is it just you know is it all equal mm. in terms of just like this is what I want it to feel like and we're gonna do this and that and that, and that. with this album it was very much so the music was made I knew conceptually what I wanted to do inside of the album and the Sonics. Um, but I honestly didn't get the title of the album until two months after the album was finished. Mm. Um, and I'd sit there knowing what I wanted the album to be. Cause I always said that I wanted it to be like a, I wanted to feel like you're at a funeral, but sonically be like euphoria. Um, and the, I wanted it to be the middle ground that I walk as an indigenous man, where it's like the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and it's constantly treading this middle ground in between. Um, so all of that was during the, the writing process. And then it wasn't until like I started speaking to Zane, who shot Five Foot Freestyle, and then we were driving around looking for, I had, the, I had the album title in mind, but we're driving around looking for a location for Five Foot. Then we started speaking about cover art um, and really just breaking down like characters of Love Too Soon, Five Foot Freestyle, and getting into not only the visual world, but just like what these characters inside of this visual world represent for me as not only an artist, but a person. Um, so it was very much so just a lot of conversations that stemmed to figuring out what we want to say and, and portray in visuals. Definitely. And the title, Color and Done, as a phrase, what does that mean to you? It's a, it's a few things. So basically like, the, I always knew I wanted it to be um, a word that sounds beautiful in the title or when you read it. And I feel like color is such a nice mm. sounding word. Um, and I wanted to put a word next to it that kind of fuck with a little bit. Um, so that was the simplicity of me finding that. Once I had those two words, I was like, okay, but what does this, what does this mean? And for me, it's like, as an indigenous man and as an artist that's indigenous, there has always been, I guess, this this premeditated idea of 
the music I should make and the person I should be, um, even within myself, like me putting on, not necessarily a front, but sometimes acting a certain way, knowing that I have to hold myself a certain way. And a colour undone on a personal level means taking all that away to rebuild myself. Because that's what it was. It was like nights in the hotel room on the oils tour, crying, like being like, okay, cool. I just did 15,000 people with fucking Petey Garrett. I get back to the hotel room and it's like, but my cousin ain't here to see this. My aunt ain't here to see this. My uncle ain't here to see this. And I was just like, what is that stemming from? That's stemming from me not being able to, or not having dealt with trauma just yet. Mm. And so in those hotel rooms, it was me undoing myself completely by myself. Not having any outside distraction, leaving the TV off, not checking my phone, and just sitting with my thoughts for a minute and, and figuring out like who I want to be, what I don't like about myself as a man, what like what I what I want my music to be about. And that's where the title started to kind of just the concept started to come in. Once I had a color undone, it was like, that's what this shit means. Yeah. And even even more so it's just like for for people to view the album with those words and the word colour as political, but when you listen to the album, there's obviously deeper meaning. Yeah. The album's not political. No. It's just like joints. It's very introvert. It's joints. Not int- yeah, introspection, sorry. Yeah. yeah, and I wanted to question the audience and put a question out there in the title of like, if I say colour, why do you think that's political? And so that's why I called it a colour on done. Definitely. And I think now that you speak about it like that, the artwork is super interesting as well because it's so joyous, it's freeing, it's just like a bunch of kids running in a field, mm. which is so beautiful. But I think, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm definitely speaking on your behalf here. It must feel like there's a constant anxiety in everything you do, like just in case, oh, am I doing the wrong thing? Am I saying the wrong thing? You know, with your with how you've grown up and everything that you've experienced. So like even like kids running on a field, mm. it's like in the back of your mind, it's always like, what if someone falls over? Mm. What if a parent looks away and they're over on the other side and they're 200 metres away? So there's like, even though there's like a beauty in like the, and it relates to the title as well, in the musicality of it, there's like always that juxtaposition of like in the back of your head, something else is going on. Yeah, something something's always wrong. Something's always prevalent that makes you anxious or can make you second guess something at all times. Mm. 100%. Because like even in my greatest moments thus far in my music career, the uncle passed away the next day or we have a moment where like I get a phone call five minutes before I go on stage and I get told another uncle passes and I've got to save face get on stage and perform and so what the the cover is is like it's the it's the representation of um, that middle ground I was talking about it's them about to take their journey into it and it's me viewing that as enlightenment and what I see now is like after my journey so far and the journey of the album, getting to an enlightened point and reflecting on the journey that has been, it's me being like, what do I vision that as? And that was a simple conversation with Zane of like, it's when I jump on the trampoline with my five-year-old brother yeah. and see him happy, just doing the simplest of actions. And from that conversation, it was like, the look and the, the way that kids I guess feel when they're running or about to go somewhere and take off, like we all remember that feeling. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's like you're either gonna fall or fly, but whatever way it goes, you don't care. You're just enjoying that moment. The present. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just the beginning. It feels like just the beginning as well. <laughs> but um, <laughs> when did it sort of sonically start to form? Is it with Kwame and I'm like, mm. we're writing an album, or is it? oh, hang on, these songs sort of fit together. Oh, shit, here's 12 of them or whatever. So it was, Oh, wow, what the hell? Mm, it, was, it was interesting. It was, um, writing trip was obviously, you know, it's thing. I wrote, I think, like 10 joints on that writing trip. None wow. of them made the album except oh, for right. Sharks, which was one. Kept that. Um, we had a session with Phil two months later, which I don't know came out of. Uh, and then we went, we knew we were going to lock in. It was just before lockdown started again, so we were supposed to go to the Blue Mountains. Um, thankfully, super random, but Alex the Astronaut 
like offered me her studio space um, for shout two out. weeks. Big shout out. Yeah, big shout out. That would not be possible without Alex Astronaut. Shout out to Alex Astronaut, 100%. <laughs> like, I cannot thank her enough <laughs> for the opportunity that she gave me to have a space to make this album. But basically, we had the space and we made three songs before we went into the actual lock-in. And those three songs were four, sorry. Uh, What's Your Step? Find You, Heaven With You and Check. Find You, Heaven With You and Check were all written in the same day. Yeah. In the same like 12 hours, we just cycled through them. Um, we're supposed to go to the mountains. Zero was like, why don't you just stay in that space? She's obviously made great music. Yeah, you're going now. We're there for another six days and we wrote the rest of the album in that six days. How important is like, and obviously um, the writing trip obviously didn't result in the album, mm. but why do writing trips, as an artist generally, album, conversation separate what out of what what does pulling yourself out of your comfort zone Mm. or your normal natural environment or a normal studio do for your creativity where it changes things or makes you look at things from a different perspective i think it just allows you to have some space um Mm. what those writing trips did for me there definitely wouldn't be an album without that first writing trip just because of like the connection made with you know the people that i now hold close as friends and creative peers but i think going away somewhere or really just locking in allows you to clear your head of whatever is going on because in a world today where you're just constantly fed everybody's drama or everybody's opinion i think it's so hard to focus as an artist on the vision you want to i guess put out in the world um and so personally for me i just found it to be like space and just allowing myself to be creative without worrying about what's going on in the outside world around me. Definitely. I think one of the main things I love about the record um, is the way it flows and ebbs. Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, genre changes and stuff, which is all great, but I love how short some of the songs are. Mm. They're short vignettes into your life, and it's a really palatable and easy way to digest the stories that you're sort of saying, which I think is so awesome. And I think in today's day and age, an artist can be selfish, obviously, and say, here's my beautiful targeted fantasy in scope and, um, like, length. Mm. But, like, it's hard to digest that now because the world's different. Mm. And I believe that a minute 30 or two-minute song can be just as impactful as a seven-minute one. 100%. Was that, like, a conscious effort or is that just, you know, a bit of a, a mind dump and that's just sort of how it works? Um, uh, a bit of both, but it was definitely a conscious effort to be, like, when I went into the album, I was very honest with myself, like, what don't, what don't I have at the moment? Like, why? And of course, the journey that I have been on, I'm super thankful for. But there's always that question of like, okay, why hasn't my shit gone just yet? And it was just like, uh, I know it's perfect timing um, because the stuff I was able to sort through myself, um, I was able to do so. And now I feel like I'm ready for what this album will bring. But it was definitely a conscious decision to to just question myself and be like, okay, people know I can rap. That's cool. Do I have the big joints like Love Too Soon? Or do I have the choruses that are just like radio joints? Or do I have the little short two-minute song mm. that people can play and just enjoy regardless? So it was definitely a conversation that we'd all have yeah. between each session. Definitely. I've listened to this podcast not long ago. It's one of like the other Apple Music, I don't even know what it is, Pharrell was speaking about this idea of like music in the era of the algorithm, Mm. where it's like, if you make music for the algorithm, then like it reinforces that algorithm where it's like, oh, this is what people want. It works with this. It just keeps going. And it's like this cycle of like cookie cutter stuff and music and stuff. And sometimes people write music for the algorithm and it's great. And it has it six months and Mm. it makes them the bank and they get out. And I think that's super cool as well. And I'm not saying Mm. that's bad. And this is sort of a big question as well, because I sort of reflect on what I do in this situation. But do you think there is an alternate universe where you, um, you almost do sort of decide to make the cookie cutter music, or is it never an option? Um, I think it has its place. I don't know necessarily if it has a pla- it has its place in my music, um, purely because I think by default. I just so happen to have grown up loving the craft of 
songwriting, rapping, singing. Um, so I think that I could never necessarily completely turn away from it. But I do see the positives in that type of music because there's people out there that love that, that yeah. shit. So like, who am I to say that that music is bad if somebody else is enjoying it? Like, obviously it has its place. So I think that there may be somewhere down the line, not necessarily for cookie cutter, but I think... It's pretty hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but, but I, think, I think there's definitely uh, something to learn from everybody mm. in this yeah. industry, in this fucking world, that like I'm never going to be completely shut off to like, no, nah, I'm going to do it like this. Yeah. Maybe the better way to put it is like purpose-built music. Yeah. It's yeah. like you're making music for, you know, 11.45 in the club and you just know, like, yeah, I think that's super interesting. Well, even Czech though, Czech was just like, it's just having fun. Yeah. So like, I feel like there's still a sense of like, and that was the line I was kind of treading on the album was like, okay, there's purpose in this, but how do we make it digestible for the everyday listener? So if they want to go back and understand entirely what it's about, it's there to do so. Mm. But if they just want to play joints by itself, there's joints there to do that. Yeah. You started rapping from such a young age, which I think is super interesting and started making music as like, I'm an artist at such a young age. How, are you almost grateful that it took you this long to decide on making a debut album instead of rushing into it earlier? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think like, and that's the thing is I didn't even decide to do it until like six months before we locked in for it mm. because I was always just like, um, I, I, I think as artists, sometimes you feel like you need to release a debut album when you have the whole world at your feet. But yeah, I think the debut album is what gets the whole world at your feet. And if it doesn't, it's the steps to getting yeah. that because nothing ever happens overnight and anything that does is gone the next day. Yeah. So I think like for me personally, I'm super content with like just out of purely being able to deal with my shit internally, like the trauma that I, that I have from, from the things that I've seen, um, you know, and just questioning myself and really just growing as, as a human allowed me to make the album the way that I feel like I could represent myself the most in the current time. Um, so I don't ever think about, you know, if this album would have been made six years ago yeah. or like last year or whatever. It's more so like as a person right now, am I the best person I can be? 100%. Yeah. Are there things that I still need to deal with? For sure. That shit never goes away. But in terms of like debut album, it's perfect timing. Definitely. Wait, so how long did you write the album in? Like a, like in that like that in that period of time you're talking about, where it's like we wrote most of the album. How long is that? Six like, days. Yes. Yeah, well, did you restrict yourself to that time period to finish it, or did you just fall out like that? We had seven, yeah. um, <laughs> and then we got to we got to the sixth day, and I think we went to write another joint, and we were just like, because we're in fifteen, there's fourteen on the album. Uh, we got in the room, we started writing, and for the first time that entire week, it was like, uh, okay, maybe like yeah. it's, it's cool, but maybe not. And then we're just like, the album's yeah. it's done. Do you think it, it helped heaps to have that, like, this is when it's happening, to write it in that time? Yeah. it I, sort of restricts all the, the mm, overthinking and the... 100%. And there was definitely, like, uh, you know, the, the feeling of, okay, we're doing this now, whatever take comes. Because we went to, we went to uh, tracking properly the next week. So mind you, in the six days that we were writing the album, we were never thinking about tracking it correctly and recording it correctly because yeah. it was just demos. We got to uh, recording the next week and we went to re-record some songs and it just wasn't hidden the way that we had it like when we first recorded it. So like, thankfully we were able to make the original recordings work. So most of what you hear on the album is literally like the first, second or third take of the day that we made the song and we just were like, cool, that's done. Definitely. How much does Supreme Butterfly mean to you? It's like, I, I was, how old was I when I actually dropped? I can't remember. I was, def, I was like, I think I was in like year 11. Um, that shit means a lot to me. That, there's, there's that and a few other albums that are very like, that hold a place in my creativity. Um, I think again, purely just being like in high school in Barrowville and some of the stuff he was talking about um, was, very relevant to what was happening at home. Definitely. Yeah, that was a very like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? Question. But I think it's super relevant because 
similar to what he does on that album, what you do in here, um, the way I've written it is you sort of just like, you just destroy your ego. Mm. At the top, it just disappears and you wash it straight off you. You know, you unravel every single layer and become like this new, more mature person in the way that it flows and the way that it ends as well, especially which we'll talk about. Mm. Um, do you think that as you've gotten older, um, it's been easier to talk about your scars or do you think that being more self-aware about them has made it more difficult to sort of write about them? I think as I've lived with them a bit more, it's, I've always been able to, I wouldn't say talk about them in music, I was always able to hide it behind a concept and be like, I'm speaking about this, but there's enough of a wall there that if people question it, I can hide behind it and be like, ah, oh, it's not about me. Like, yeah. it's, it's a concept or whatever. Mm. There was always some underlying stuff in the work I'd put out that was me. Um, and I honestly think just those nights, you know, spent by myself dealing with stuff and just, like, realising, I guess, that there's a lot of stuff with inside of me that I haven't dealt with yet. Um, there's a lot of things that I don't like about myself in that time. I think it just was... I was able to see that and not ignore it and then be open to being like, this is who the fuck I am. Yeah. I, I, I don't care because I'm okay with myself, scars and everything. Like, yeah. I'm fine with it. How free do you feel then after having this done? I feel in terms of like... Either creatively mm. or personally being like... Because it feels like a reset for you as an yeah. individual. It's definitely a reset. Um, like, personally, I, I feel like there's still some things in my life that I'm trying to, I guess, figure out within myself, whether that be uh, mentally or stuff with family issues or, or things where I can talk to people more direct that are in my community, not just be somebody that's speaking about it outside and for the community. Um, but I definitely do feel like I've stripped away a lot of the ego and the envy that can sometimes come as an artist. Um, and there are definitely times where it still creeps in. I don't think you can ever get rid of those things. But it's just about like, okay, how can I control that? And how can I be aware when it pops up? Yeah. So I'm like, if it pops up, it's like, okay, I know what this is. I know where this is stemming from and I know how to deal with it. Yeah. So in terms of personally, it's tough. But like, I feel, I feel quite free, but I know there's still some shit yeah. that I'm um, looking to, to accomplish within myself. And now that we're here, let's talk on it. Um... Tread light. Remind mm. me of the opening song of the album. Uh, watch your step. So I love that. Even just looking at the track list, mm. starts with watch your step, and then the sort of end result, the underlying sort of like I see it just from like looking at the track list point of view. It finishing with just the song title tread light mm. sort of shows this narrative of you know be careful at the start and then tread light and tread well. Mm. But that song, like, is is crazy like it's the result of the album it's the final compliment of the album and the reason i asked it to be my butterfly question because i think it has big massive mortal man energy as well mm. um i was brought to tears by it i think like a lot of people will as well um like i thought about all the people that i've lost i question you know my mortality mm. my ego all of my shit but the end of it to me and I, you might not have intended this but it was you know it's so liberating um you talk about everything and everything you've gone through pretty much. Um, and no matter what, at the end, you'll give your step right and you'll tread lightly, which I think was just, you know, so beautiful. Like, mm. talk about getting in the state of mind for that last verse and, like, delivering it like you did and being mm. that hungry. Like, what does it take to get in the booth and say that shit? Well, with, with that, like, it was really... Um... It was the sessions in the Alex Astronaut studio and I was able to write that song in its entirety in like 15 minutes just purely out of like, okay, I'm ready to speak about this. I know what I want to say because I've been meaning to say this for a long time. Mm. Um, and we had the third verse and it was still the same motion and energy as it is now. We recorded a take there and we were getting back into the studio two weeks later to record the saxophone for it. Um, and in that day, we were like, let's just take the song. Let's do the song again. Um, did the song again. It's funny because when I when I woke up that morning, I checked like, I think it was like Facebook memories or some shit. And it was um, a year to the day 
that the cousin who the song is, is, is about and speaking on, it was a year to the day that he passed, the morning that I woke up to go record Tread Light. And so I woke up and I saw that and I was like, all right, yeah, I, I know what it is. Like, and I know, I know, like, I know what this means. So I went to the studio, uh, first verse, second verse, sweet, still quite emotional. Third verse, hit it, and I was like, turn the lights off. Like, I, I like, just let me, like, mm. turn all these lights off. And just, like, I think we've done two takes, just in case, vocally, yeah. like, as always. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, we did, but we did two takes, and for me, getting into that mindset, it's, it's funny because it's not too hard because I know it well. I, I've been to many funerals in my life. I've, I've seen, you know, my little sister at, at the age of 10 looking at a coffin mm. being laid into the ground. So, like, I've, I've seen, you know, cousins pass away at, at 27 years old. I've seen a lot of shit that, thankfully, it's allowed me to be able to, it's a gift and a curse. It's allowed me to tap in and out because sometimes when I don't intend to tap in, I'm there. Yeah. Um, but it's it's purely just out of knowing myself and in some sense it's it's ignoring it because a lot of the time what I would do in prior years would be like, okay, this happened, somebody passed, funeral, da da da. Okay, but like let me put that here. Yeah. And let me like work, work, work. Because if I work, work, work like that's gonna go away or like I need to be the person that's doing this because all the weight is on my shoulders not from anybody else but from myself yeah. um, and I got to a point when Knox who is the cousin in Tread Light he passed away in 2020 um, at like 27 from, from heart issues um, and I think that was the first time because it was in COVID where I had space to be like this just happened and it was really me in that moment being like, cool, let me, let me learn how to deal with this shit because I've never learned how to deal with it. I always push it aside. Yeah. Um, and because of those steps taken from 2020 to recording the album, I was able to tap in. And as soon as we finished the verse, I was obviously still shaking up a little bit, but like I was able to tap out and be like, cool, I can yeah. have conversations with everybody. Do you think that music's the healthiest way for that side to come out as well? Yeah. For sure, like 100% because I know that I let go of a lot of stuff um, that day. Like even just having, you know, being able to write the second verse from my cousin's perspective, speaking to me, because the whole song is basically wanting to have a conversation with death and seeing death coming. And first verse, I'm not necessarily speaking as myself, but I'm taking the conversation from somebody else. Yeah. Second verse you can notice that like I am speaking from the perspective of a bunch of people I've lost and then it gets into like my cousin speaking to me like and telling me don't be fearful of the journey but just watch where you walk like step right you know what I mean yeah. like like yeah of course this is inevitable and you've seen a lot but there's still fear in that and just while you're here and while you're in this middle ground and treading this middle ground make sure you enjoy it and step correctly not even in a, in a sense of like be careful it's just like as yeah. somebody that has now dealt with your shit step correct and keep continuing to do these things is that the best song you've ever written i'll say it is thank you i i like i don't i don't necessarily go back to it yeah because like at, at times when i need a bit of a pick me up of like a reminder real quick of like album or what i'm doing this for i listen to tread light which is such like because I can tap in and out of it, bro. I sometimes if I need to like get a bit of inspiration to go and do some work or hit a workout or go actually yeah. do some shit, I want to play tread light yeah. because it's like, okay, that's right. All of this shit that I'm trying to do, this is what I'm doing all this shit for. So I think tread light is definitely up there, but I also like I really like heaven with you yeah. as a, as oh, songwriting. The perfect segue. Yeah, as songwriting, heaven with you. But tread light in terms of what I wanted to say and really just putting myself out there um 100 and some of the lines in that song like i i listen back to it and i'm like wow like some of those lines in, in tread light are incredibly yeah. insane heaven with you mm. 
it blew my mind when I first heard. I was like, what is going on? Mm. In a good way. Yeah. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. Were you in the studio with just Malboy? Like, was... was yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, she came in through. my eyes, like, she's God tier Australian artist. She is, yeah. She's like, great. elite. Mm. Like, how can you hate her? Yeah. So, was it... What, what is the feeling like of, like, her walking into a session? Because she's, like, like, she's a different level. Yeah. So, like, thankfully... I've known Jess for like maybe like a year or so before I asked her to get in that song. Good. Um, Not good, but... <laughs> but yeah, yeah. No, but good for that situation, <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Um, I supported her, I can't remember where the venue was, but I supported her in 20, late 2020. Um, and bro, even just watching her play Bean Waiting and like her hits, like mm. she got me to get up for Running Back and do a verse <laughs> on Running Back. And I was like, yeah, like easy. So like the, the relationship was already there, but I remember... Um, texted her and I was like, hey sis, have this song for you. Because as soon as we made it, we're like, has to be Jess. Yeah. Um, and it went quiet for two months. <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah. I was like, damn, we ain't getting Jess on the song. Because she wrote back, she's like, yep, for sure, send it through. And then it was just like, it was quiet because she's busy, she does her thing. Um, the voice and on that. And so I, we just kept, pu- yeah, exactly. We just kept pushing um, and she sent through vocals and of course, I was like, this shit is amazing. I was yeah. like, but, can we get in the same room and finish it? Because I know that, like, I want to write the end section together. Yeah. She was a G. Like, she's such a great person. Um, she came through to the kiln. And honestly, just, like, watching her record, I was, like, wild. And just, that is the most wholesome recording session I've ever had in my life. Like, it was me, Kwame, Nikos, and Zero, and, and Jess, and I just remember thinking to myself in that session, like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, like this is wild. Um, and she just stayed for like three hours, three, four hours. And she was only supposed to be there for two. She stayed, heard some of the album, played her tread light. You know, of course, she, she cried. We spoke about the concept of the album. Um, I spoke to her about a lot of stuff and just got some game of her and just really gave her her flowers of like, you were and still are the representation for us. But for the longest, you were the only yeah. representation at a, at a level in Australia that we could aspire to. Yeah, because again, I think you've said this in an interview before. It's like, it's, I don't know actually if you've said this or mm. maybe I'm just so clever that <laughs> I'm just <laughs> like, of it. Oh yeah, um, it's only athletes and now musicians where it's like you have the, like for First Nations people, it's like, mm. that's where you get the representation from. And then don't even start me on how Australian sports media, media treat First Nations rugby league. That's players. exactly why I didn't pick rugby league like over music. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, I can't speak my mind or, yeah. or be who I want to be. But yeah, that's why just I think like so so underrated mm. as a, as a musician as well. Like it's it's not easy to write pop songs like that. No, and then also just her character, her demeanor, her enthusiasm and stuff. It's just beautiful. She's so incredible. Such a great role model for everybody in the world. And I think people need to remember that she, like, she's been in this for a long mm. time. And if she wanted to, she'd have every right to not be as uh, caregiving, as, like, down to earth as she is. Because, like, even just from an outside perspective, I know she's been in the game for a minute. There's definitely some stuff she would have been through and some stuff that she has, you know, had to put up with. And so for me, I'm always just super appreciative of her being the person she is because it's like, you don't, yeah. you don't owe anybody that, but she still shows up every time for, for anybody. Also, it's like, obviously the song's pretty poppy, I think, relatively. Mm. Her being so willing to just get on like an album cut, mm. where it's like, it's pretty late in the track list. You know, it's like, it fits into the album perfectly and like the scope of that, just to be like... Oh, it's going it's to be a single, though. Yeah, but like... You like know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, where it's like... But it's not like a like some shit Illy would write with Vera Blue, you know what I mean? Like not like not no, in, not, not no, in a no, disrespectful way, but I know a, exactly what you mean though. Not in a disrespectful way, but it's not the standard pop rap joint. Yeah, yeah. That would that someone would often ask Jessica Malboy for. Yeah, and that's why I think she appreciated it so much because like she walked in and she was like, "You've given me my Faith Evans moment," and I was like, "Hectic." I was like, "Mad." Yeah. Um. I want to talk about Kwame. Mm-hmm. Um, he is on Not For Safety. Yep. If someone's executive producing your album, <laughs> who, who says, 
get on this one or don't get on that one? Like, how do you draw that line and not... Because he's such a big and, like, invested artist himself. Mm. How does it almost... How does he get... How does how do you choose what song he comes on in? And how does it almost not... Like, how do you sort of set the boundary in terms of, like, you know, working with two big personalities? That was actually never a conversation. No. Not for safety was made. I was actually made on his... Um, writing trip session to Melbourne when we did his album. Um, like, I, he, he flew me down for three days just to be in the room for energy, and we, we wrote a couple joints, um, and Not For Safety came out of that. And then even when we went into the room for my album, there was never a song where it was like... Yeah. Uh, or he was never like, let me do a verse on this. He was just like... Even with Tread, like Tread Light, when we got to that moment, he's like, what do you want to do with this song? This is, your, this is you. Like, you take whatever you want me to do right now, production-wise, tell me. Yeah. Um, he was very, like... And he's somebody that I feel like is going to go on and executive produce a lot more records because he allows artists the space to be an artist yeah. and, and you know, uh, be critical with the vision that they always have, I guess, seen. Um, and as much as he... As much as he was open to that, he was also very integral to track listing and we would talk yeah. every morning together about okay how does this play into this con concept reminding each other of like the overall story of it um so it was never that it was never yeah. that conversation but not for safety like was was wasn't even directly an album song and we got to the sessions we're like nah this joint we've got to bring this on yeah how important was it having that like not even yes it was writing the music and etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. But how important was it just having that second opinion next to you the whole time? Being it, like, it was, yeah. it was like, um, there wouldn't be the album without that second opinion. Purely just, you know, conversations had every every morning or after every joint or or him really pushing me on on find you to to do a run, and I'm like, I don't know if I can hit that. He's like, you can hit that. Like, and just like really taking some stuff from him and me coming into the room and giving him some stuff as like the overall story of the album, I think, was, you know, um, a moment that I'm forever thankful for. And I know that, like, we both learned a lot from each other inside of that creative process. Definitely. Um, this is sort of like, I'll let you be selfish with this question. And it does not necessarily a theme or a lyric or a song or it can pretty much just be a vibe or an me overarching message without giving anything to away. Mm. But if someone was just to sit down and really focus and listen in on the record, what would you almost want them to take away from it? I'd say, honestly, just like sitting down with yourself and sorting through whatever things that you have going on personally that you need to sort through to become a better version of yourself. Definitely. Because that's like what I am continuing to do and what I did that led to the creative inspiration to the album. So it's simply that, and I, I guess them just viewing somebody that is not afraid of the world seeing him be open and exposing himself. Definitely. And what do you think you're most proud of, of the record entirely? Is it just making it? the music that's come out, the emotional side of it, it coming out. I think just, just makes honestly, you most proud? honestly saying that I have a debut album, like, especially in hip hop and rap, it's such a thing that like, I feel like just being able to now say that makes me proud to know that I've done it because now that I know how to do it, I can do it 10 times over. And of course it's going to change each time, but at least I know that I'm able to, and I know the process and the steps it takes to get into that zone. So it's that and, and like track list wise, probably tread light, the entire thing. But I think what was most challenging to me, is tread light, love too soon, how to leave. And I'd say, I'd say watch your step. Like, those are so sonically different to anything I've done that I'm super proud that I was able to execute that. Definitely.
And I'm, I want to ask some silly questions because we always ask silly questions at the end. But I'll say now, Colin and Dunn, when's it out? It's like eight. If not now, oh, we'll say. Whatever happens, it'll be coming. It's such an incredible record. Please go listen to it. It's just, yeah, it's special for this country, I think. Mm, thank you. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, what's it like? This is more, maybe more of a serious question than I thought it would be, but I should have asked this earlier. What's it like, say, supporting Just My Boy or supporting well, performing Midnight Oil? What does that do for, like, when you go back to the computer and make music? Does it have a tangible difference in how you think about making music? Is it more the performance or is it just hanging around them as characters, do you think? Mm. Does it change anything? I think it does, subconsciously, for sure. Mm. I don't know exactly what that is yet, but I definitely know that, like, watching Midnight Oil play to the amount of people that they did and run through their catalogue at like 60 plus years old and play a two hour set is just like, for me, what I took from that is longevity and uh, I guess just like stamina. Um, with Jess, same thing, cause she's been in it and just watching her set and her perform and being a professional at that. As people, what I took from Jess a lot was just like down to earth, um, showing time. And even just what I took from their crowds was they're so open to somebody like me stepping into these sonic worlds because it's such a different thing um, that it kind of cemented the thought of like, okay, I am able to cross different audiences. That's Definitely. what those two did for me. And then I guess on that note as well, when it's all said and done, you're sitting back with six RN number one records, you've done stadium after stadium, um, how do you think you'll measure the success of Tasman Keith? Like when you're looking back one day, mm. you know, not so much from an achievement point of view, but from a personal point of view, you know, how do you think you'll measure the success of your career going forward? I think whatever I can eventually um, put back into my community because like all this stuff is cool, of course, but every time I go home, I'm reminded that still broke still poor, like still struggling to eat, still got health issues. There's still a lot of things that even though I'm doing good and and personally as somebody that's dealt with their, their trauma and their shit, I'm in, a, I'm in a comfortable, not necessarily comfortable, but I'm in a spot now where I can be reminded how to deal with things. That's fine. But if I don't kind of pass this knowledge on to other people, then like, what's the point of it? Because like, I'll be gone in 80 years. So like, cool, is this either gonna be just like a moment or is it gonna be something that I can kind of maintain forever through my family, my community, and even the outside world? So I guess that's how I would measure my success once Definitely. it's all done. Beautiful. I'm really appreciative for your time. So thank you so much yes. for coming on today. I do need to ask though, you wake up, um, maybe after a few drinks about before, it's about midday, um, you're starving mm -hmm. and I'm talking takeaway like no no local fish and chip joint I'm talking like big mainstream takeaway garbage yeah what's the choice McDonald's oh, <laughs> like easy quarter pounder it's yeah, horrible if it's if, no if we're talking shit yeah McDonald's or over, over KFC depending nuggets Macca's or KFC nuggets and this is, this is my I'm time not, I'm to not getting, I'm not getting nuggets from KFC. If you're getting nuggets from KFC, you're doing it wrong. Okay, you know what burgers, I mean? KFC or Macca's? Zinger, all day. Not Damn. even close. All right. Hungry Jack's. Other burgers are really better at Hungry Jack's. No. You don't think so? The buns are just bigger. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Macca's, for the Macca's beef burger, mm. bro, if they sold Macca's double quarter pounders in fancy restaurants, they could charge 35 bucks for that shit and no one would have a clue. They're so well put together. I'm just saying that KFC is so elite. KFC chicken burgers over like, I, don't, I do not have McDonald's chicken burgers, like no fucking way. Have you ever had the chicken and cheese from McDonald's? Oh yeah, yeah. Elite. Yeah, yeah okay. I've, but not a zinger. No, nah, not a zinger. But me, I'm still like, I'm still McDonald's. Out of the two, I'm, I, I fuck with KFC, of course. But <laughs> this is a very deep conversation better, now. Yeah. But I'm, I'm more likely to eat McDonald's. Definitely. Fair enough. Wait, so you get a double quarter pounder meal large? I don't do a double. I do a quarter pounder meal, put Big Mac sauce on it, put the chips on that, and then nice. eat that. Perfect. And then also, last question. Ask this to everyone. Um, 
Obviously, you've got the parry talk slash purple sneakers grilling today. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a pretty good interviewer. Who would you, you know, you can like neck nominate someone to be in the hot seat. Hot seat. Who should I talk to? Who's worth talking to? Who would tell a good story? Or who de who deserves a platform? Damn. I wasn't expecting that question. Other than Jess Malboy. Um, let me say... You don't feel, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you don't feel. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like Kwame. Because like, I, I know that dude has a lot yeah. to speak about and say and has a lot of opinions. I'd love to see that shit. Um, and I know that like he's somebody that like I said, has a lot to say. So I'm just keep it keep it close and say him. Sick. Thanks so much for listening. Actually, Peter Garrett. Oh, PG. <laughs> Peter Garrett. That's something my mom would be proud of right there. See, that's what I need. But thanks so much for listening. Thank you for joining us in this beautiful room for the first time ever. If you've watched any Paratalk interviews before, your eyes were burning. <laughs> but today we're looking pretty. You probably think I look completely different to how you thought I looked. <laughs> Not looking on an iPhone. But please go stream this album. Go pre-save the album if we're at that stage yet. Go stream the singles. Do it all. Get tickets. Buy merch. Everything. PayPal him. Do everything. Give him your life savings. <laughs> but no, I really appreciate your time. Taz. No, thank you. This conversation was epic.